afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Public Health Ontario Microbiology Rounds presentation on COVID-19 diagnostics to save lives and lives, livelihoods, promises and challenges. My name is Vanessa Tran, and I'm a clinical microbiologist at Public Health Ontario, and I have the pleasure of moderating today's session. Before we begin with today's presentation, I'll just mention a few housekeeping items. The chat pod has been disabled to limit any distractions during the presentations. Please use the Q&A pod if you have any questions during the session. A discussion and question period will follow the presentation. If at any point during the session you experience any technical difficulties, please email capacitybuilding at oahpp.ca. I would like to state that as the moderator of the session, I did not have any potential conflicts of interest to declare. It is now my absolute pleasure to introduce the speaker for today's presentation, Dr. Rosanna Peeling. So Dr. Peeling is currently Professor and Chair of Diagnostics Research at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, the Director of the International Diagnostic Center, or IDC, and Professor at the University of Manitoba. She trained as a medical microbiologist and worked as a research coordinator at UNICEF, UNDP, World Bank, WHO Special Program for Research and Training in Tropical Diseases in Geneva, and was the chief of the National Laboratory for STDs in Canada. Her research focuses on defining unmet diagnostic needs, facilitating test development, evaluation, and implementation. She established the IDC to advocate for value of diagnostics, foster innovation, and accelerate access to quality assured diagnostics. Please help me welcome uh, Dr. Peeling to today's micro round. Thank you very much, Vanessa. And thank you for inviting me to share with you my thoughts on uh, COVID diagnostics and how we actually try to use it to save lives and, and livelihoods. Um, and, and my focus has been for the last year or so, uh, a, a global focus, especially to try to um, help a lot of developing countries that have uh, limited access to diagnostics. Okay, so to begin with, I, I just like to acknowledge um, this uh, special term of use uh, for Public Health Ontario um, and that uh, uh, Public Health Ontario assume no liability from my uh, presentations or owner of the content. Uh, so in the next 35 minutes or so, I, I'd like to share with you the, the role of diagnostics play in the COVID-19 pandemic response and some of the innovations that we've been um, trying to uh, pilot to save lives and livelihoods. And then uh, I want to end with some lessons learned uh, from the pandemic and how we can build back better uh, post uh, COVID-19. Now, at the very beginning, as soon as uh, uh, WHO has declared um, uh, this to be a pandemic, uh, the Director General already urged countries to test, test, and test. He said that testing, isolation, and contact tracing should be the backbone of the global pandemic response. Mm. Now, I think we all know that um, uh, diagnostics is not only uh, for uh, guiding patient management, um, but also for uh, on a population basis uh, could be used for disease control and prevention uh, because testing could enable um, uh, identification of uh, cases, can enable contact tracing and then screening of those who are at enhanced risk of acquiring and transmitting the infection in order to interrupt the chain of transmission within a community or within the population. And that testing data enables us to actually map the location of cases. And we've all seen the dashboards um, that we check daily um, uh, within this pandemic to know what's happening around the world. And, uh, and this allows us to identify hotspots and actually track the pattern of transmission. And also for for many countries, they use this kind of dashboard to guide their implementation of disease control measures in terms of whether to uh, impose lockdowns or mask mandates, et cetera. Now, for the COVID-19 pandemic, we've never had such an enthusiastic response from industry. 
if you look on the left hand column, you would see that we have almost a thousand different tests that have been developed for, uh, for this particular uh, disease. And uh, we've never had that, not even for HIV. And so right now uh, from the FINE website, you could actually see um, that there are almost 400 molecular tests. Most of them are manual tests um, that are done in the lab, but there are some uh, point of care uh, tests that could be done outside of lab settings. Um, and, and these are used to detect viral RNA and, uh, and optimally used within the first uh, days from onset of symptoms. And it, their use case is actually to confirm infection uh, in, term, in those who uh, present uh, with uh, signs and symptoms that are consistent with, with COVID. And I think that uh, for for accuracy, they are the most uh, molecular tests like PCR are the most sensitive and most specific. And so they are the gold standard in terms of uh, what we should be using. But unfortunately, they are um, not very affordable nor very accessible for many countries. And, uh, and so antigen tests have been uh, developed uh, later in the, in the pandemic um, so that countries can use these tests to detect viral proteins uh, and uh, it within also uh, the first uh, week of uh, post onset of symptoms, again, to confirm infection. And unfortunately they are less sensitive, but nevertheless, they, are, they should be uh, sensitive enough mm. to detect those who are at risk of transmission. Now they're more uh, uh, they're cheaper and more accessible in that they could be more easily done without a lot of um, training and uh, and so um, especially the point of care rapid tests are single use disposable tests that could be um, that are instrument free and could be used anywhere. Now, there are also a lot of serology tests and uh, right now um, they should be used as a marker of exposure and for surveillance, but we still don't know the correlates of protection. So we don't exactly know um, exactly how to interpret uh, results uh, if we, it's used for, for patients. Um, and these are the, the kinds of tests that we could use uh, for the pandemic. Now, there are a lot of these tests are not very good quality. So it's really important to make sure you have, um, uh, you have evaluation data on their accuracy. WHO has only uh, given uh, emergency use authorization to 16 molecular tests and three antigen rapid tests. Now, the role of diagnostics um, has really evolved over um, the last uh, year uh, or so. At first, because um, the pathogen is new, diagnostics after uh, the molecular tests were uh, developed, the diagnostics were used to try to refine the clinical case definition for COVID and also to test all symptomatic uh, individuals to enable public measures to be, um, to be instituted to interrupt them, uh, uh, transmission, as well as uh, used to determine the extent and the speed of transmission of this new pathogen within a population, and also to conduct studies to understand the modes of uh, transmission. And so um, in the early days, um, some countries tested all contacts of confirmed cases, uh, but others did not. But with these um, studies to uh, test contacts, and uh, it, we then realized that there was a lot of asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic uh, transmission. And so the second phase in terms of the role of diagnostics is that now that we know the transmission within the community, could be um, uh, actually from asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic individuals, we need to think about how to scale up uh, testing. Uh, but many countries, um, it, 
already in, in March and April started to impose lockdowns to try and slow the spread of COVID in order to save healthcare systems from being overwhelmed, especially intensive care beds. And so um, there's a, a, a lot of countries that could not afford to uh, put in lockdowns. And so because a lot of their population depended on going out to, to make a living. And so um, there are a lot of efforts trying to scale up testing, especially in, in developing countries. And how could we do that? We started with um, helping them to screen populations at enhanced risk of the acquisition and transmission, such as healthcare workers, care home workers, and first responders. And then uh, starting to use um, tests for travel, and occupational groups outside of healthcare settings, such as in, in Canada, um, I think meat packing plants had uh, outbreaks and, uh, and uh, other uh, care settings in Europe, mink farms, et cetera. And so, so that went on for a while, but um, as we come to grips with the control of the infection, uh, of the uh, pandemic, uh, rapid tests are really needed to enable um, us to have safe environments for reopening of schools, workplaces, religious gatherings, and, and cultural and sports events, and to allow economic recovery uh, uh, and travel. And so, um, but then we're complicated in this phase by having uh, variants of concern that are um, at increased risk of transmission and also uh, the speed of transmission is, is really um, um, is, uh, increased a, a lot, especially with the Delta variant. And, um, but then we have vaccination that um, with the rollout, maybe the demand for testing may increase, but it's now important to think about surveillance and to track the uh, variants concern. So, in terms of um, uh, just detection of um, cases uh, in symptomatic uh, patients presenting for care, this is a WHO algorithm, which is not unlike the Ontario one that I've seen, uh, which is that you start uh, using molecular tests. And uh, if a patient's positive, then it's confirmed that they have SARS-CoV coronavirus too. If they're negative, but um, if there's still a high uh, index of suspicion because of other, um, or because of their clinical presentation and other uh, tests such as uh, X-rays, then repeat the molecular tests. And if it's positive then um, uh, they are a case. And if negative, they still should adhere to public health measures. And in some cases, although this is not a WHO recommendation, in some cases, um, if it's still negative the second time, um, uh, some countries will do an antibody test just to know whether they have been exposed. And this is possibly a case of long COVID. Now, there are many countries that actually have very limited access uh, to molecular testing because of the global competition for, um, uh, for tests and for reagents and even swabs. And some countries like Zambia ran out of swabs very early on and couldn't do any testing. And, uh, and so uh, in general with molecular testing, even in developed countries, uh, we're grappling with not enough capacity, uh, not enough equipment to cope with the demand um, and also the high cost of the test. And the results, because of the high demand, would take normally would take an hour and a half or two hours to do a run. Now um, it could be taking days. And even though they are point of care tests, their supplies are limited by the speed of manufacturing. A lot of the um, uh, companies like Cepheid and Abbott said that they could only um, manufacture so many devices and cartridges per month. And, uh, and so um, many countries have very limited access. So um, I, I think in terms of the weight for molecular testing, even though it is the most accurate, I want to give you an example of what happened in Kenya. In May of 2020, um, 
um, uh, the government of Kenya decided that truck drivers um, driving within the country and to all the different uh, countries like Uganda, Rwanda, and South Sudan and Democratic Republic of Congo, they, they are at risk of transmitting, uh, carrying their infection and transmitting it along their route. And so um, uh, they, the government of Kenya wanted all truck drivers to be tested uh, to, and have a negative result before they could leave the port. And because uh, Kenya has only a few hubs where uh, molecular testing can be done, the, um, the, the truck drivers were waiting as much, uh, as long as two weeks for, uh, for their test results to come back. And so um, there was a huge congestion at the port of Mombasa and no goods were moving, especially essential goods. So the International Organization for Migration uh, in July stepped in uh, providing a, a high throughput um, rapid um, mo uh, molecular test, PCR test, in order to ease the congestion and make the results available within 20, four to 36 hours. And, um, and so, so this illustrate to you, not only do we need to look at um, a, a test being available and accessible, but also the time to result is really important in a, in a pandemic. Now, so that's driven a lot of the development of um, a simple um, point of care instrument type tests. So there are antigen tests that could um, uh, that are instrument based, and um, and here there are some that uh, can take as little as uh, twelve minutes to get a result. Now this data is all company data, so um, this this is not independently evaluated data. But the problem, as I mentioned before, is the uh, uh, manufacturing the instruments that could be a problem, even though maybe the strip is a lateral flow strip. And so then a lot of companies started to do a single use disposable antigen tests, just like the, you know, uh, rapid HIV tests. Uh, they are not instrument dependent, they could be done anywhere. And here in this example, I, I showed you that um, uh, there are some that are FDA approved uh, for emergency use, and there are three that are WHO uh, emergency use authorized. And the performance data for the WHO um, uh, proof tests are uh, from the uh, independent evaluations from uh, the Foundation for Innovative New Diagnostics. Now, WHO has recommended a sensitivity of 80% and specificity of 97% compared to a molecular test that is approved by, by WHO. And I'd like to say at this point that a lot of these, um, I think most of the antigen tests that I know uh, have their um, target as a nucleocapsid protein of um, uh, coronavirus 2 rather than the spike protein. So, uh, so they are unlikely to be affected by the variants of concern, uh, which really um, uh, has a lot of immutations on the spike protein rather than uh, the nucleocapsid protein. Um, one thing that I do want to point out that is um, uh, if you look in the green area uh, under um, both the Abbott test and the SD biosensor test, I put in the CT values, which is the cycle threshold values for uh, amplification. So the smaller the number, the means are higher the viral load. And we generally equate um, um, the in fact, the risk of uh, transmission to anywhere uh, between uh, CT values of uh, uh, 25 uh, to 27. And so you could see that uh, for these uh, rapid antigen tests, they actually can capture most of the people who have um, mm -hmm. viral loads um, that are um, equivalent to ones that are equivalent uh, to um, able to transmit infection. So in fact, it's, it's good if you could find a test that is really um, sensitive and could pick out anybody who's at risk of transmission, um, at least 
even if you don't exhaustively track down every single case. And these tests are um, right now uh, for, for these rapid antigen tests. In the US, you could buy them uh, $20 for a box of six tests. Um, I don't know what the prices are in Canada, but in general, you could buy them over the counter for about two uh, to two and a half dollars US. Now, in some countries, um, such as Cameroon, they know that they cannot afford to lock down, uh, but they want to minimize uh, mortality and they want to be able to uh, control the spread of infection. So what they decided is a national algorithm that used rapid antigen tests as a starting point. And so if anybody is positive with the uh, rapid antigen test, they're considered a case. If they're negative and the person is symptomatic or at high risk, then um, a PCR test is uh, done on, on those patients as a reflux test. And um, if they're asymptomatic, then they're uh, considered not a case. And if the PCR test is positive, then they are considered a case. So instead of starting with a PCR test, they start with an antigen test and supplement uh, anybody who's negative uh, with a PCR test. And that way, they actually um, said that with a population of 26 million, they were able to uh, um, detect uh, 80,000 cases and 60% uh, of them were detected with the antigen test. So in doing so, they actually saved a lot of money uh, so that, and, and also the, the demand on uh, PCR so that the results from the PCR could be um, uh, returned a lot sooner. Now, in scaling up um, a rapid test, I, I think that um, we need to, uh, I showed here a lot of the, um, references that um, uh, document asymptomatic transmission. And also the fact that this silent uh, transmission within a community needs to be addressed. Otherwise, it becomes the Achilles heel of current strategies to control COVID. Now, in thinking through how you could do that, uh, we're starting to move uh, from uh, testing in healthcare settings in order to save lives to testing in non-healthcare settings to save livelihoods. Uh, and what we needed to do is to have a much broader uh, framework for policy consultations so that we're not only consulting with within uh, public health uh, and healthcare sectors, but we're consulting with at departments of education, civil societies, finance, trade, tourism, and, uh, and border securities. And there's a lot of context in terms of um, uh, testing in the community uh, that is based on political, cultural, social, and economic. And I especially want to say that it's really difficult to test in communities uh, outside of healthcare uh, setter, sectors. Um, because in many countries, unlike in Canada, um, they don't have any uh, wage compensation if a person's positive and test positive and have to stay at home. So a lot of people would rather not be tested and be found to be positive uh, because they don't want to have to stay at home because then uh, there's no way to, to make a living or to feed their children. And so um, I think somehow, we need to remove these disincentives uh, for testing and to convey our um, strategy in very clear and compelling messages to the public. And, and so I think that um, this phrase to, to use rapid tests to save lives and livelihoods actually came from the director general who made a, a, a appeal to countries in September of last year to make uh, 120 million affordable quality assured rapid tests to be available for low and middle income countries uh, so that we could uh, use it as a diagnostic tool, but also use them as um, public health tools. And um, but there are significant problems with logistics, with uh, training a lot of people, and also um, making sure the quality of the uh, testing is good, and also trying to capture data 
Um, so I'm just going to give you some examples of what's been done in different countries. But before I do that, I just like to point out um, that I think um, in unlike for symptomatic patients, when you have testing of asymptomatic patients whose pretest likelihood of testing positive is low, you may end up getting uh, more false positives and real positives, even if your test is very uh, specific. And so it's important to note that for symptomatic populations, you, you try to do a reflex testing on negative uh, with antigen uh, people test negative uh, with an antigen test. But for asymptomatic individuals, you need to test uh, do reflux testing for positives to try to avoid false positives. Uh, these tests have very good negative predictive values. And so uh, this is something that um, I gave some references at the bottom, especially the Watson one, uh, which is in BMJ. They have an interactive um, a tool for you to interpret um, your test results. Uh, if you put in your test sense of uh, test accuracy and your pre-test likelihood. I also want to give a shout out to the uh, nice uh, article in the CMAJ about use of uh, rapid antigen screening uh, as a public health tool uh, by, Alice, uh, by Schwartz and uh, Alison McGreer um, in March of this year. Now, test to protect the vulnerable uh, and to save lives. The, this will be healthcare workers. Um, uh, we need to think about how, who to screen, uh, how often to screen and what tests to use. And so uh, I think we want to look at uh, screening healthcare workers, uh, elder home worker, care workers, essential uh, frontline workers, and also people who work in uh, uh, public transport. And, um, and this is to protect the, the vulnerable uh, and, uh, and people that they may care for. Uh, and so um, there's some modeling that's been done to um, see how you could grapple with the, the three A's of accuracy, affordability, uh, and uh, accessibility, also time to result. And this um, uh, table that I showed you is from uh, the paper by, by Chin et al. Uh, on uh, use of um, antigen testing in high-risk health, healthcare environments. Now, they, the model is based on daily testing, which is uh, quite uh, frequent. Uh, I don't think uh, there's many places that do that. Um, but in their model, they show that even if you decrease the test sensitivity by 20%, the effectiveness is um, not decreased very much. But the test, the time to result uh, really significantly uh, uh, decrease the effectiveness. If a delay of three days uh, it goes from 85% to 57%. In this five days, it's 85% to 26%. So time to result becomes really important. And so um, the, what test to use then um, means that if molecular test turnaround time is suboptimal, then you should be using um, uh, antigen, rapid antigen test. There's also uh, a a modeling group at Harvard uh, headed by Mike Nina, and, uh, and they showed that, um, that the, for screening, um, test sensitivity is secondary to frequency of screening and turnaround time. And so here in this graph, uh, each uh, circle is a point of testing. And, um, and where the upper line, the upper dotted line is, uh, it shows with antigen testing because it's more affordable and easier to do, uh, and you can get rapid turnaround results. You could afford to do it more often um, and more likely to hit upon the infectious period of a person. Whereas if you are thinking of PCR and, um, and can only do it uh, infrequently, then it, you may miss that infectious period altogether. 
And so it, it is really important to think about these as you think about how to use antigen tests. So there are um, also ways that you use um, tests to release uh, from quarantine uh, to save livelihoods. And I want to use travel as an example to show the interaction between um, you know, how you use tests and, and quarantine. And so here's a, a model from um, the, the Alex Cook's uh, group in Singapore to try to uh, look at the effectiveness of different strategies for testing and for quarantine. And so everything is compared to S1, which is the strategy one, which is no controls, that you, you have a, a pretest uh, for boarding, but after you land, there's no control, you could, you could come out. So uh, the least effective out of all these uh, other strategies is just quarantine everyone for seven days. Um, it doesn't seem to be um, good enough. Uh, the next one is testing on arrival, but just denied entry of any pers person who's positive. That because it's a single time point that you test, so the, it's not that effective either. The most effective ones are these three, which are um, testing without any tests. Uh, you just quarantine for 14 days, which is a real hardship if, if you're traveling to some place for a one day meeting. Uh, but if you can combine testing with quarantine, uh, when you have testing on arrival and you anybody who's positive uh, quarantine for seven days um, uh, uh, with a test to release, then uh, it could be as effective as uh, uh, testing on arrival and quarantine for 14 days. And so these are various ways to, to look at how you could use testing. But of course, everyone is wanting to remove that um, quarantine on arrival. And so um, the um, London School Group has done some models to show that if you um, have pre-boarding screening with an antigen test, and then on arrival, instead of quarantine, you have daily testing post arrival for five days. You're, it, it's almost as effective as um, uh, PCR for pre-boarding screening and then daily screening for, for, five, for five days. And so these are all various uh, um, models that could uh, be used for, for policy. Now, what about tests to enable and save livelihoods? In terms of return to work uh, and also to schools, because this is a, a, a fixed environment, a constant cohort that's in daily contact uh, or in constant contact, um, and we you don't have to, you know, uh, we, we need to think about uh, how frequently to test, uh, but we don't have to do any post um, uh, testing, uh, but we just use the community uh, test, uh, positivity rates as an indicator of whether things work or not. So on the left-hand side, I showed how in Ireland, they actually modeled whether to use antigen tests or to use PCR tests, taking into account what I said as the three A's of um, accuracy, affordability, and accessibility. And um, they actually um, settle on uh, antigen testing twice a week. And, um, and they set up a, a port cabin uh, at the entry and people do take their, it's a self-collected swab, uh, which is supervised and then somebody does the testing. Um, and then CDC, I think, and uh, I think probably Government of Canada has lots of um, guidance on schools, so I'm not going to go over that. But uh, for drug stores uh, testing, uh, uh, Brazil in May of uh, last year already started to authorize drug stores to, to test in the community. And there are 88,000 pharmacies in Brazil. So they did a lot of testing. And this is during the peak of when uh, the SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, actually hit um, uh, Brazil in a very hard way. And so there are also tests to enable, and, and these are more difficult to monitor in terms of their effectiveness. Uh, because people come from all different places, uh, have different risk backgrounds, at least with the previous one, um, these people from, come from the same community. Uh, and so um, 
we started to have an evidence co-op uh, that actually collects some of this data on what worked, what didn't work, um, because a lot of these uh, uh, pilots are not written up in the peer review literature. And so uh, Singapore has a pre-test, uh, uh, pre-event testing uh, uh, website that could give um, uh, guidance on what to do, tell you where to uh, to get uh, your events uh, organized in terms of testing, who could help you uh, and how often you have to test or how, uh, when you uh, should be able to do your tests, uh, et cetera, uh, for, for trade shows, conferences, weddings, et cetera. Uh, there are also sports events, and I think those have been very high profile. We all know what happened with the NBA and, and also for, for football. And, um, and soccer. And, um, and then there's all these music events. And I just like to um, show you that there's one randomized control trial that was done by, in, uh, uh, was published in December of last year, but it was done a little bit uh, earlier than that, where they actually look at the effectiveness of having uh, people tested uh, on the on the day of the event, they open the venue nine hours before the event to test everyone with an antigen test. Uh, but they also took samples for molecular tests just to confirm. Um, the The testing is only one of many measures uh, for uh, for this event. They do temperature checks. Everybody has to wear an N95 mask, but they are allowed to uh, sing and dance as they they want and to to mingle. And um, uh, the event was about five hours. Most people uh, stay for about two and a half hours and they do have uh, adequate ventilation and they do have monitors to know that people are wearing their masks at, at all times. Although I, I don't know how well you could sing when you're wearing an, an, an N95 mask. Um, now, what's really important is that post-event, eight days after the event, they actually did both um, antigen and molecular testing, and they showed that actually nobody in the uh, intervention group was um, uh, had an infection, uh, whereas in the control group, now this control group um, also were tested um, beforehand, but they were uh, not allowed to go into the venue. Uh, and, and there were two cases within the control group, which is within the, the testing positive rate for, for the community. So this is um, um, Lancet Infectious Diseases asked me uh, to write an, uh, an editorial about that. And, and we use that to argue for, for um, organizers of these um, mass gatherings to write up um, their um, pilots in order that people could learn from them. So in the, in right now, we are in a period where we're transitioning from pandemic response to control. And I just like to say that there um, increasingly, there are ways that you could check whether your test is being affected by the variants. And, uh, and so this is just to show you the PATH website and also the US uh, FDA um, issues um, advice on whether tests have um, been affected by the variance concern. Now, I want to get to the lessons learned from this pandemic. I think one of the biggest lessons we've learned is the inequities of access. Um, uh, and, and this is not only in developing countries, but uh, in developed countries, within developed countries. And we need to also rethink uh, our public health approaches. Often we think of, um, we think of um, public health as telling the public what to do, but we know now that we need the public to understand uh, why we're doing, uh, why we're asking them to, to stay home, why we're asking them to wear masks, et cetera, so that, so that they could be part of the public health response. And, and I think that there's enough uh, science literacy now in the public 
uh, with this pandemic so that they understand testing is important. Uh, they need to know where to get tested. They know uh, after uh, they get their test result, they, they need to adhere to public health measures. As, as one of the company um, executives told me, they, uh, he said that for the first time, the public actually knows the difference between CPR and PCR. And, uh, and that's, you know, uh, something that's really changed. And so I think with this increased uh, literacy in, of the public in terms of the signs and, and uh, diagnostics, we, we need to be um, really advocating for changed ways that we approach public health. So in building back better, we need to think about health systems that have better community engagement in order for the public to be uh, more engaged and also people-centered services. I, I'd like to say that in Canada, I, you know, I've been sitting in Winnipeg since March of last year, and um, I think Canada's done really well. But there are some issues in terms of community access to testing. And I like to give this example of what's happening right now with syphilis for the last uh, uh, five, six years. I remember six years ago, I worked with uh, Emmy Singh from Alberta and Nikki Pai from Mon uh, uh, Montreal to try to advocate to Health Canada to approve rapid syphilis tests. To, for, for syphilis screening in remote areas to be done, because I know in many remote communities, they don't even have anybody who could take venous blood. And so um, having tests that could be, that could be used with the uh, whole blood is really important. Uh, but unfortunately, Health Canada declined and would not, even though I gave them all the data that I acquired when I was working at WHO on uh, in, um, introducing rapid syphilis tests across the world. And so, um, you know, I think that it's a, a very easy uh, thing to think about the trade-off between sensitivity and access um, because Health Canada told us that the rapid syphilis tests are not good enough because they only have a sensitivity of 80 some percent. Now I, I show them that even if you have a really good test of 100 percent sensitivity but it's only accessible to 30 percent of the population uh, it's not really, uh, uh, you know, so few people could be screened. But if you are willing to sacrifice 20% sensitivity, but it's accessible to 90% of the population, immediately, you know, the people that you could screen increase from 30 to 81. And so out of 100. And so I think this is a, a, a no brainer in terms of, um, you know, being able to uh, control disease this way. Uh, we've even taken the test to the Amazon, uh, to the Amazon forest in Brazil. Um, and, and there, you know, it's, it's been saving lives ever, ever since. And so I'd like to say that WHO has pre-qualified three um, dual HIV syphilis rapid tests. And, um, and these are the top three. And, um, but WHO, you know, pre-qualification, it does, doesn't seem to sway Health Canada to be using these. And Health Canada is in, still insisting on uh, doing clinical trials with these tests. Now, so, you know, for COVID, Health Canada has approved many types of tests, but I worry that, that the um, um, screening of um, cases in communities would, be, would not be as effective if the system does not allow them to do that because there isn't a, a way to do um, uh, community testing the way that it needed to be done for, for syphilis tests. So, um, in the end, from the pandemic, I like to advocate for building back better in Canada uh, to have uh, not only uh, a really good system, healthcare system that's envy of the world, uh, we needed to instill 
within that system, a connected diagnostic system that could form the backbone of the healthcare system that becomes the eyes and the ears of the healthcare system to know uh, unusual uh, disease patterns that are happening that may be potential uh, outbreaks or you know, to find out the syphilis outbreaks before they become uh, such a, a problem in Canada. And mm. so that's my, um, um, my plea for post-COVID in Canada, and that the lab could uh, act as a command center because with the introduction of point of care testing in communities, um, the lab need to take on a more um, uh, role to evaluate new point of care tests, uh, doing training quality assurance, and collating the data, bringing back the data. Um, and, you know, we ever advocated for this uh, way back in 2017. And I've been, um, one of my co-authors for this paper is John Nkengason, who is now the head of the Africa CDC. And we're doing, trying to do that in, in Africa. So after the pandemic, um, there's been a couple of papers published already about what to do uh, to be better prepared for the next pandemic. And here we, um, one of the recommendations is globally accessible diagnostics and deep sequencing tools to establish continuous and sustained global surveillance of disease and variants. So in summary, I just like to say that uh, the COVID pandemic has given us many teachable moments, but I think in terms of the use of pub, uh, tests as public health tools to protect, to release, to enable. Those are quite a lot of the challenges that we're facing right now. But we need to really um, think about using this opportunity uh, to build back better and build a better diagnostic system that would serve the healthcare system a lot better uh, from uh, top to bottom. Thank you. And thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Rosanna, for that very excellent presentation. Uh, we will now move on to the Q&A session, and we're just going to shake it up a bit today for Micro Rounds. I would like to invite Dr. Antoine Kerbe to join our Q&A. Uh, Antoine is one of our excellent medical microbiologists at PHO, and he's led a lot of the point of care and rapid antigen testing here at PHO. You may also remember him from our July Micro Rounds on the quality framework for point of care in Ontario. So welcome, Antoine. We're so happy you could join us. Uh, so there's a couple of questions in the Q&A pod, but please continue to answer your or ask your questions if you have not already had the opportunity uh, to do so. So there is one earlier on, a very good question. Why are rapid antigen testing for COVID not recommended for someone who has symptoms or had high risk exposure? I think if, I, I, I think if you have the, um, uh, if you have the ability to do molecular tests, um, why wouldn't you do it? Uh, I think is, did I understand it correctly? Is, why is it not recommended? Well, if, if you have a, a molecular test, you, you should certainly use it. Uh, because I think in the early days of the pandemic, we are trying to uh, refine the clinical case definition. We're trying to count every case in order to know what the pandemic looks like, right? And so uh, in, I mean, to this day, I think if um, uh, we, we still want to be able to know uh, what long COVID looks like, uh, whether there are unusual things that we, we never pay attention to, you know, things like um, the loss of sense of smell, et cetera. I mean, that's only because we, we you know, are trying to, track down every case in order to know all the manifestations uh, of um, the disease, right? So, so I think that's why we don't recommend antigen tests in the beginning. But when we needed to screen communities, that's when we started to think, okay, you know, we really need more accessible tests and we need to sacrifice a little bit the sensitivity in order to do that. So in Ontario here, we only recommend it for asymptomatic screening. I don't know, Antoine, if you wanted to address some of the considerations around that implementation. Exactly. Thank you, Dr. Peeling. Thank you, Vanessa, as well. Um, exactly. So in the province, we are recommending um, antigens 
testing for only for screening for those that are less at risk. For those that are at higher risk that have symptoms that have a high risk contact, uh, we are recommending molecular testing on the basis, as Dr. Killing was mentioning, of the kind of seeing the breadth, the scope of the diagnostic uh, infection scale and, and the, the prophetic infections and the impacts of the infection itself, as well as the turnaround time. So the fact that we have a turnaround time that is uh, oftentimes within uh, 24 hours, for example, having uh, molecular testing on on um, on an acute uh, setting is still um, appropriate compared to antigen testing, which would be uh, beneficial to begin with. But most of the the individuals will still require PCR test, being in the higher risk category, um, and most people would have a negative antigen test um, from from the provincial um, testing positivity rate as well. Yeah, and and I think I I like to say that although we we say that the antigen testing can pick up most people who are at risk of transmission, we're not sure, right? And so uh, I think if you have the ability to use molecular tests, certainly you should do that just so that you you are trying to capture everybody who's at risk of uh, transmission. Thank you. Uh, and a very great question coming up. So. Given that a lot of the reasons to advocate for lower sensitivity rapid tests to be made available is due to inequities in to access to testing, what are your thoughts on investing the resources to better access, for example, faster samples, transportation, better resources for collection, more local testing infrastructure versus currently more accessible testing? I, I think it's... it's... <laughs> It's a, it's a great question, and, and we've been struggling with it um, uh, for a long time, is whether to, um, uh, to build specimen transport systems versus um, uh, having rapid tests uh, or, you know, building healthcare infrastructure to, you know, uh, I, I, think, I think that there are um, pros and cons with each approach. On the whole, Building infrastructure is much harder um, than you know because the the technology uh, is has been you know the advances in technology in terms of a faster tests, more uh, sensitive tests. That's really been uh, you know uh, phenomenal in terms of uh, the early days of um, you know rapid tests not being very sensitive, uh, and now you know we have many different technologies that could be <clears throat> could be faster. And and I think that um, in some countries they think of rapid tests as um, being not sensitive, but that's not true. We we now have molecular tests like the RPA, the recombinase, uh, you know, uh, polymerase uh, amplification test. That will give you an answer in fifteen minutes, um, and uh, and also the Abbott, uh, the new Abbott test would give you an answer in thirteen minutes. Oh, you know, and and so so I think the technology is, uh, you know really working very well in terms of uh, advances to make tests more accessible, faster, et cetera. But we also should be trying to build infrastructure as well, right? And so, so it's not either or, <laughs> that's, the, that's the option that uh, it's often debated. Yes, absolutely. Antoine, I don't know if you wanted to add additional comments to that. I think building infrastructure is difficult at the best of times and building infrastructure in the middle of the pandemic introduces additional challenges. Exactly. So that's something that we're always um, grappling with. So, so there's the theoretical aspect of it and, and the, the, the usefulness of testing, but then there's the whole implementation scale that can be quite problematic as well um, and having reduction in, 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 the, in the effectiveness of some of the testing uh, suggestions that we have. So yeah, it's, it's always a, a struggle. So um, there's a couple of questions that I'm going to combine. So uh, one is about, uh, it's around the false positivity of rapid engine tests. So what could cause that false positivity? And the balancing the risk of false uh, reassurance doing, do, it, do often to the lower sensitivity of the point of care test versus need for accessibility. So in particular, there is a perception that people may be willing to do a certain number of tests. And so a test with high sensitivity would be preferred. So a two-part question, what can cause a false positive rapid antigen tests and, um, and balancing uh, this with, um, with the willingness to do testing? Okay, so so I think um, the the false positives uh, 
for um, with antigen tests when when you use it in an, uh, a population that is has very low uh, uh, pretest likelihood of testing positive. Um, that's something that is really difficult to avoid because even even when you have a, a test um, that exceed the WHO recommendation of ninety seven percent specificity, even if you have ninety eight percent sensitivity uh, specificity, when you use it in a population of like one percent uh, prevalence, you're still going to get more po false positives than real positives. But um, when you use these tests as a public health tool. The major advantage is that you let the people who are negative into a venue, right? And so, so having to um, uh, having to have somebody who's uh, uh, false positive, uh, 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 whose positivity rate has to be a result has to be confirmed. Um, that's just another story. But you know, if ninety eight percent of the people could go into uh, safely into a venue. And 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 be not be transmitting infection, the the two percent that that you retain and have to retest uh, or to to uh, use a second antigen test or a fast molecular test to know whether they're true positive or uh, not. Um, that's a, a secondary thing to to what we want to achieve in terms of creating the safe environment. It, it's the same as um, using dogs to screen at airports. Dogs may actually, um, uh, and, and I'm actually chair of a, a pilot study for the UK for canine detection at Heathrow Airport. <laughs> and so um, dogs are likely, and dogs have good days and bad days, and dogs are likely uh, going to identify more false positives than real positives. But um, uh, if they identify those people and we quickly use a, an antigen test or a fast molecular test to show that they are indeed not positive. Um, I mean, that's a very, very uh, small um, inconvenience compared to 300 people having to go through, you know, testing, right, uh, at, at airports. So I think there's all these trade-offs. So the, the, I think the, the second part in terms of uh, incentives for, for testing. There, there is now a lot of home tests that people, because people would like to know. I mean, uh, a lot of people said to me, I, I wish the testing center would take us uh, because uh, we go to the testing center and they say, you don't have symptoms, we're not gonna test you. Uh, but they like to know whether they had COVID or not because we've all been in situations where we may have been exposed, right? And in Canada, it's so safe to know whether you're test positive or not, because uh, even if you uh, couldn't work because you're positive, um, you, you have a wage compensation, right? And you have support systems that support you. In many countries, that's not the case. Um, and so people are not willing to test. Uh, or, or that they don't trust the test, right? Uh, so, yeah, and I think uh, there's just like one, so we're, we're just one last question as we run the time. Like, how do you balance that? So the lower sensitivity of the point of care tests are risk for a false negative, um, and having that increase accessibility versus using a high sensitivity test if a person is willing to just do a certain number of testing. I don't know if there's a an answer or a threshold for that, but it's um, I think that is. Well, I, I think it's, it's really uh, difficult uh, for, you know, so I, I sit with many policymakers and, and the risk appetite um, for different countries are all different. And, and I think it's the same across Canada, right? Different provinces have different ways that they handle uh, testing strategies. And so there's no one solution. The, the idea of, uh, so we organize this evidence co-op to try and um, tell countries that, you know, there are all these different things you need to consider. Uh, and then how you make the decision based on all these options and all these uh, pros and cons is really up to the situation in your country uh, and also your appetite for risk. 
uh, taking, etc. So sorry, I didn't answer directly. <laughs> I don't think there is a direct answer. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time today. So as we wrap up today's PHO microbiology round session, I would like to ex extend my sincerest thanks to Roxana for presenting and Antoine for joining our Q&A today. Thank you so much. I would also like to thank everyone who joined us for today's session. It was great to see such strong virtual participation during such a challenging time for everyone. So thank you very much. Uh, you can expect to receive a brief and anonymous PHO round survey for today's section, uh, session. Please try to complete this as it really helps us to improve our programming. And lastly, to access past PHO rounds presentation and view confirmed upcoming sessions, please visit the PHO website head to education and events and click on presentation. So thank you so much everyone and have a fantastic rest of the day.